we, as we finish talking. Uh, but anyway, so we are very happy to have the first speaker of the semester, is uh, uh, Dr. Stefano Marchesini, and uh, from Stanford University. So uh, Stefano did uh, his PhD in Grenoble, where they have the best synchrotron facility in um, in Europe, in my opinion, and then there's a, a, a postdoc uh, at the uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab working on another synchrotron facility at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And uh, then he became a, a staff scientist at the Lawrence Livermore Lab, another major national lab that is managed by Berkeley. And then a staff scientist at Berkeley. And uh, I know in more recent times, he transferred to Stanford, where he's now a staff scientist. So he has been uh, working on uh, synchrotron radiation and uh, in particular holography, and now is working on X-ray lasers, uh, microscopy in X-ray lasers uh, uh, at the facility uh, at Stanford, and is an optical fellow for development of the highest resolution microscope in the world. Okay, so we have a, a wonderful uh, talk for us today. And uh, so given that we have a little bit of a time constraint, I'm going to let Stefano start. And if people are interested to talk, uh, just uh, ask questions in the afternoon. Thank you. Or at the end of the talk. Bye. All right. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you for inviting me. And uh, thank you all for coming here to listen to my talk. So we I have a little bit of a time constraint. And uh, I have a lot of slides. But uh, I'll recap you know, once in a while in case people miss pieces. So. As uh, Professor Zanolin uh, showed, uh, explained, uh, I'm going to talk about high throughput X-ray imaging, uh, which is work I've been doing at various places, um, France, uh, uh, Berkeley, Livermore, and now a Stanford Linear Accelerator. You can see the building here, the, st the Stanford Linear Accelerator. It's a mile-long building. It used to be one of the, long the longest buildings in the world uh, before the LIGO, I think, uh, building. And it's a linear accelerator that produces very powerful X-ray uh, laser. It, it's a billion dollar machine, but uh, in case you wonder. Uh, so my talk, uh, I'm going to talk about X-ray imaging. i give you a, a kind of an overview, not very detailed, uh, but X-ray imaging, uh, X-ray sources, different X-ray sources, and then different methods and what you can do with these things, and some variants different kinds of imaging methods, uh, such as holography, tachography, and so on. So let's say um, that you have a new material, or a new protein, or a new drug, and you want, or you someone brought back a sample from a space mission, and you want to know where uh, things about your sample. Uh, typically, you want to know the structure, the either the like composition, chemical composition, uh, or also where the atoms are, the uh, atomic arrangements. Also, normally, if it's a um, uh, material of interest for electronic applications, like a photovoltaic or a microchip, uh, you want to know the, or like a superconductor or semiconductor, you want to know the uh, electronic properties. And also, you want to know the dynamics. Uh, so what happens when you uh, hit uh, the sample with a laser or with a hammer or or uh, whatnot. So uh, there are many things that you want to do and, uh, um, on these materials. And uh, wha the primary methods are, some of the primary methods are these uh, powerful X-ray sources. Um, so you can see here uh, uh, a picture of the, is there a pointer, by the way? Well. Anyway, so you can see here a typical picture. The most uh, this is the most standard application of X-ray imaging, but uh, for medical application. But uh, thank you, thank you. But what we do in uh, in these high, much more powerful X-ray sources, the, the if you look at the brilliance or the amount of photons in a given phase space, the tubes that are used for medical imaging are down here, and if you go up 20 orders of magnitude, you go you get to an X-ray laser. So an X-ray laser will completely destroy uh, your sample uh, while you're studying uh, this uh, 
but uh, it gives you much uh, import more uh, uh, detailed information. So when you do X-ray imaging, uh, what typically what you want to know from X-ray imaging, you want to know the uh, the, uh, the reason why we use X-rays um, and why we want and wha wha what are the characteristics that we want from an imaging method. So one thing, first we want uh, good contrast and low noise. So you need a, a, a bright source. Uh, then you want to be able to go through the material and penetrate through it in order to see what's inside. And that's why we need X-rays. X-rays are good at penetrating through material. And then also, in uh, if you're looking at small things, you want to have a high resolution. And uh, you know, to the resolution in a microscope or in an imaging system is limited by the wavelength of your radiation, so that's why X-rays are good. And then also you want to do uh, image things fast and get maybe an animated movie of your sample. And uh, also you want to have different colors, in, uh, in particular in the X-ray regime, different wavelengths, different colors will, g will tell you about the chemical composition if you if the X-ray is above a certain excitation energy, you have high contrast than if it's below. So by changing tuning the wavelength or the energy, you get different type of contrast. You can select different ke chemical or see different chemical elements. Then also you want to, in principle, get a 3D image of your sample. And uh, also, uh, even though you want high resolution, you also want to look at uh, big samples, and uh, possibly you want to avoid destroying your samples. So the, uh, getting all these characteristics in an imaging system is difficult, uh, not impossible, but uh, uh, so you can uh, kind of have to adapt to uh, the particular science of your sample that you want to study, uh, the type of microscope or imaging system that you want. Uh, so. For X-ray sources, you have different types of X-ray sources. Uh, one is a synchrotron, where it's a, pa a linear, a circular accelerator. Uh, you can see here a picture. Uh, this is about 10 meters long. The whole uh, synchrotron is maybe uh, 200 meters wide, and so there is a ring electron beam that is accelerated inside the inside this uh, 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 ring and. Uh, Tangentially, it emits X-rays, and so attached to each of these uh, tangent points, there are uh, pipes where the X-rays come out, and attached to these pipes, which are called beam lines, there are different instruments. There is like a microscope, a spectrometer, an electron diffraction, and so in this particular synchrotron, for example, there are 40 instruments that operate simultaneously, all doing different experiments. You have users. Uh, they come from different disciplines, biology, chemistry, material science, uh, space, uh, uh, some space uh, samples, or microchips, electronics, photovoltaics, and so on. Uh, so overall, within the United States, these kind of machines serve uh, roughly 10,000 scientists a year. They come and do experiments and try to uh, characterize the material. If you look at the, so you have these two types of X-ray sources. One is this uh, part, uh, li circular accelerator that produces uh, synchrotron sources. And the other type is a linear accelerator where the electron beam is much smaller and it goes through a very long magnetic uh, structure. And inside here, the uh, X-rays are, uh, they start like a synchrotron. And then as they propagate, continue propagating, they start to amplify themselves as they propagate together with the light. And so you get uh, laser amplification and you got a factor of a thousand or a billion times more peak power out of this than out of that. So you can do, so if you look at the different uh, X-ray sources, uh, the synchrotrons are somewhere here. Standard laser are here. They only produce up to a certain low, w low energy light uh, down to up to some UV light. And uh, in the X-rays to a hard X-ray regime, you need uh, at least a synchrotron. And so you can see that uh, 
the, the brightness, well, it, it keeps going up over time uh, due to improvements in the electron, uh, in the accelerator structure that can focus the electron beam and produce a brighter source. And then if you go with a free electron laser with a linear accelerator, you get uh, many orders of magnitude brighter peak power. And so now the next uh, step, so this is where we are now, but the next step is going to be another factor of, another three o uh, factor of a thousand uh, it by in increasing the repetition rate of the laser. Uh, so you can see the, the average brightness is going up by three four orders of magnitude by um, uh, in uh, having this uh, higher repetition rate. And there are other sources, uh, the European XFEL, that at the moment is more powerful than, th there's a always a race in these sources, so, uh, but uh, so very soon, uh, this year, uh, the, the linear coherent light source at Stanford Linear Accelerator will uh, go above that. So, for those who were here, or just a little recap of what I said, um, for when you have X-ray imaging, uh, why do we want um, X-ray imaging? Well, uh, X-rays enable um, high penetration to through the materials. That's uh, therefore you are able to look in to inside the material. Um, and then the other thing is uh, the X-rays. The X-rays. If you look at the large scale, like a human scale, the, the X-rays behave like uh, rays, so they go straight. And what you get uh, is the, as you go through a material, you get an absorption contrast. And so you can uh, get an absorption image of your sample, and then uh, you can rotate your sample and get the three-dimensional information. But if you want ma higher, res at higher resolution, uh, you need some kind of microscope. And uh, so either some kind of lens or a computational method that uh, g gets away with the lens. Um, and then what is the contrast that you get? So as, as we just look at the rays that go through the material, you just see how much of these rays are absorbed. But if you are, uh, in general, when x-rays go through some material, so you have an x-ray coming onto your sample, you don't know what the sample is, and what happens is you get some absorption of the sample and some refraction. The refraction will uh, basically change the wavefront and slow it down. Uh, and then you have scattering where the X-rays are scattered out of the straight path. A and plus, inside the, elect uh, the, um, the sample, the X-rays will excite the electronic uh, the electrons in the various orbitals and so you either get emission, electron, uh, uh, photoelectron emission, or other types of electron emissions out of the sample. You can get fluorescent, so the when the X-rays, uh, when the electrons fall back in, in a lower orbital, they will emit uh, some fluorescent light that can be X-rays or can be visible light. And then also you have uh, inelastic scattering. Uh, just to give you a quick example, uh, if you just look at the electrons uh, that come out and uh, you look at the electrons, you, you put the spectrometer around your sample, after your sample, you excite your sample with the x-rays and then you look at the photoelectrons that come out, the electrons that come out, and you look at different, e different uh, directions and different energy. You, you put a dispersion in one direction, uh, that's a simple like hemispherical magnetic field that will disperse the electrons in, in one direction. And so what you can see here, for example, is the, a picture right on your screen uh, of the electronic band structure of your material. And that is useful if you are studying a, uh, s the properties of a superconductor or a different electronic structures. But it's quite nice to see right on your screen the, the the electronic structure that can be maybe calculated or not, depending on how well you know your material. And now, 
you can pick a different uh, uh, colors or different photo, uh, photo to electron energy and then do an imaging where you also scan your sample and look at different pieces. So you get different types of ma um, contrast in your material uh, if you combine with uh, uh, spectroscopy or things like that. Then in order to get a 3D information, what you need to do is uh, tomography. So uh, normally in a tomographic, s in a standard radiograph, if you go to the doctor's office, uh, you have X-rays go through, you measure the, ra the, absor the absorption through the sample. Now, if you're doing a, s a tomography, like a CT scan, then you have to rotate the sample and then uh, you use a simple algorithm that will reconstruct a series of, um, dif of uh, radiographs collected at different angles. You uh, apply some algorithm and reconstruct a three-dimensional body. Now back to higher resolution, if you go beyond the like, scale of medicine, uh, what you need is uh, some kind of microscope and that requires lenses. And the lenses, um, uh, so the, the limitations in an optical microscope, uh, you are limited either by the how large a lens you can make. So if you have a small lens, you will um, get a bright, a, a large uh, point spread function that will degrade your resolution. And if you make it larger and larger, you get a smaller and smaller uh, numerical uh, spot. And that will give you higher, con higher crisper or uh, higher resolution images. Now the problem is x-rays like to go, they like to penetrate through things and they do not change direction very easily. So making a lens that will change the direction of the rays is difficult. It's possible. Uh, it takes a lot of effort. For example, here, I worked here for a little bit. So you make these nanostructures of periodic, concentric, not periodic, but concentric link rings. And you have to make them very tall and, and narrow, so it's really difficult. So uh, you have to put together a, a really kind of an expensive nanofabrication facility uh, with lots of equipment to be able to do this. And even if you, uh, with the state-of-the-art equipment, what you, you can achieve about 10 nanometer, so about 100 atoms wide uh, resolution. You, you cannot make an extra, even though the wavelength will be good enough to do atomic resolution, uh, you can, it's, uh, technically uh, not feasible to achieve it because of this, uh, the difficulty of making lenses for x-rays. So another option is to just, uh, instead of, so in a normal microscope, you have a sample, you hit it with a beam with some light, and then you have a lens that magnifies your image and you take the image here. Uh, now the, y what you can do is just get rid of the lens and you put your detector here and you collect the diffraction pattern. And then the problem is how do you get from the from the scattering pattern or the diffraction pattern, how do you get from here to here? And this is a complicated problem. Uh, in this particular situation, it's called diffractive imaging that requires to solve the phase retrieval problem. It's one of the standard classical problems uh, that you will encounter in physics, at least in imaging. So yeah, when you uh, do this kind of diffraction pattern, uh, typically you need uh, some coherent light. I assume, I don't know if you know about uh, coherence, I assume the difference in, um, between an incoherent light and a coherent light basically is the fact that the waves are uh, all in synchro synchronized. Uh, they don't go out of sync, so the, that means the wavelength is fairly narrow. And uh, if you Practically speaking, if you have a inter in like a, a, f a double slit experiment, a young fringe uh, experiment, what you get is an interference pattern that looks like that. If the uh, light is coherent, you will get that. If it's incoherent, you will get, or partially coherent, you get lower and lower contrast until you get um, um, uh, basically the same pattern as if you had only a single pinhole. So now, once you have a coherent enough light, uh, you take all your like uh, standard basic uh, electromagnetism equations, Maxwell, uh, then in vacuum you get the wave equation, 
and if you have a monochromatic enough light, you can separate the the wave the wavelength uh, time and the uh, and the spatial information. So once you get a quasi monochromatic type of light, the propagation from one point to far away is called far field propagation. Is basically uh, a Fresnel propagation and uh, if your sample and the distance are far enough, you basically have a Fourier transform from the sample to the detector. So now um, you have this uh, X-ray beam that comes in, you collect diffraction patterns, and uh, what happens is you're measuring a, p a, a section of Fourier space, of your the Fourier transform of your sample, basically. And uh, as you rotate your sample, you, you collect rotated pieces of this Fourier transform, Fourier space. And so just a little recap of what I ju just described. Um, so in order to get imaging or structural information about your sample, you need a bright source. For example, LCLS is one of the, or maybe the la high, uh, brightest source in, in the world. Um, in order to get achieve higher resolution, you need short wavelength, therefore X-rays, and you need to be able to collect large scattering angles. And a standard X-ray microscope with a regular lens can achieve about 10 nanometer resolution because of the technical di difficulty of making X-ray lenses. Uh, now, the other option is to uh, collect diffraction, simple scattering from the sample, and that means you collect the Fourier transform intensity of, an of your object. So the Fourier transform, absolute uh, square. That's the intensity. Uh, but you do not collect the measure the phase. You do not know the the direction of your the where the light came from. And so we need to solve in order to get a picture out of this diffraction pattern out of this Fourier transform. You need to solve the phase mm -hmm. retrieval problem. Okay. Make sense. So. The classical phase retrieval problem is looks like something like this. So you have some X-rays, go through the sample, and then they scatter, it collect the diffraction pattern. And uh, what you want is to go from this diffraction pattern, which this is the experimental part, and then to go from here to here, you need a computational method called known as uh, phase retrieval. And phase retrieval, basically, you collect this data and you want to find a, some unknown U such that the Fourier transform absolute square is equal to the square root of the data. Uh, this, the, this difference must be zero. It's missing the equal zero. And there has been uh, many, many papers about solving for how to solve this problem. Uh, the standard, the, like the uh, simplest uh, method is like, a, it's called alternative projection where you, you have a model. Uh, you have some information about your sample in real space and then you have your Fourier transform, and then you collect the data, and uh, you you fit you fit the data, fit the model, fit the data, fit the model, and go back and forth. Um, this kind of problem has been around for about a hundred years or so. So the first, the very first um, atomic structure was solved by the Braggs, uh, where uh, they saw the diffraction pattern from salt, uh, sodium chloride. And they were able to determine that the sodium, the atoms were arranged in a, in a, I think PCC structure, or so. So then people started looking at different materials. For example, DNA. Uh, that was uh, Rosalind Franklin uh, was able to collect the diffraction pattern. Then, uh, uh, then they, based on that, uh, uh, Watson and Crick, they got, they got the structure of the DNA, and then. Uh, Maybe like uh, many years later, but then uh, meanwhile, lots of proteins have been solved using uh, this kind of diffraction. 2001, the RNA, for example, now it's, uh, it's over 200,000 proteins have been solved. So questions are, can we solve more complicated things and can we solve bigger things? Uh, or, uh, but day to day, people are constantly trying to look at new proteins and new structures, for example, just a recent example, as soon as COVID uh, came out, people started uh, 
all the synchrotrons, all the light sources started collecting X-ray diffraction, and within a month or so, they ha they got the structure of the. This is a different um, different uh, light source, different synchrotron in Brookhaven, New York. Uh, it's also another DOE lab, and uh, so uh, you collect if you you take your protein, you uh, make a crystal out of it. That's the magic of biologists. I don't know how they do it, but. Uh, they make a protein crystal, then they come to these labs with the synchrotrons, collect a diffraction pattern, and then uh, solve the phase three problem and get the structure. This is one important example. Also, all the drugs discovery, they typically need to understand the atomic structure or either the protein or the drug in order to figure out whether they're going to work or if they're going to work. So it's uh, that happens every day at these kind of light sources. There are many different types of scattering. Sorry. Depending on whether you can make a crystal or not, or like a disorder crystal, or or, um, or you have microcrystals put together. So for example, you can try to think look, look at things that have absolutely no periodicity, no crystals. You just have a single uh, object collect diffraction pattern, recover it, and you get a st uh, structure, an image of your st uh, structure. So this is an example of a, a cell image by diffraction plus phase of three bar called, this method is called uh, diffractive imaging. Then uh, you have nanocrystallography. Maybe I will talk about it later if you have time. So basically you shoot your protein, many different uh, crystals, and then you have to find the orientation then and solve the phase of three problems. Then you have microcrystals, uh, and then other more general things like uh, uh, if you if your if your molecules are small and you make crystals, then I the the algorithms are a little different. The experiment is a little different, but basically still measure the diffraction pattern, solve the inverse problem. Uh, protein crystallography very popular, uh, used every day. Uh, solution scattering, you have a, a thing, a randomly oriented protein, and somehow they're still able to reconstruct. So just uh, uh, to go through these uh, experimental methods, so you have in the single particle imaging, you collect the diffraction pattern, which is the Fourier transform uh, square times a mask if you are, uh, have regions of your uh, detector that is no, they are either too bright or too, uh, that, um, or blocked. So there are parts, typically parts of the data that are missing. Um, you have protein crystals, so you have diffraction patterns that look more like spots, and this is because of the periodicity of your sample. So you have a Fourier transform square, you have the sampling due to the periodicity of, of your structure plus uh, a mask. Um, so I if you now have different wavelengths hitting the sample at the same time, you also have to average over different wavelengths. And so your, your measurement is now the Fourier transform module square with a mask, but average over different wavelengths and then with a beam stop. Um, but generally, you always have to reconstruct uh, this from this data and then recover your sample. Uh, this is an, uh, another example where you have a single uh, molecule, a single pro uh, sample, collect diffraction pattern. Here you add some lower resolution information, but also you can get away with uh, out adding the lower resolution information. So you collect the diffraction pattern, uh, you try to solve the phase of trial problem, and uh, typically you start, uh, if you don't have no information about your sample at all, what you start from is the autocorrelation function of your sample. Um, and then slowly, as you keep on trying to reconstruct and solve the phase of trial problem, you shrink the, the region where the sample is defined, and that will uh, eventually converge some uh, often to the, uh, to the sam uh, image of the sample that you want. Then you can do um, uh, three-dimensional, so you collect diffraction patterns at many orientations, and now you do a three-dimensional reconstruction where you go back and forth uh, between the data and the model, 
and eventually you get a picture of your sample. And this was, at the time, more than uh, almost 20 years ago, at the time was the highest resolution image. So the limitation in diffraction on in this kind of uh, experiments are no longer, you're no longer limited by, by the wavelength and uh, by the lens, but you're still limited by the photon noise and by the sample stability. So the one problem is the X-rays will also damage your sample. So if you're trying to image things at say 10 nanometer resolution with an X-rays, the those that you get is roughly equivalent to being a meter away from an atomic bomb. So you need to freeze your sample. Uh, first of all, you can have a uh, live sample. You need to freeze your sample, cryo-freeze your sample, and uh, uh, then you blast it with the x-rays and up to a point where uh, at some point the uh, sample is destroyed. So there's l the limit here is about 10 nanometers. In order to go above that, you need a very short pass that will go through the sample before the sample has even time to react. So that's why x-ray lasers with a pulse source uh, can be interesting for this. So what you do is you, you have your sample, you sh put it inside your beam, you shoot it with the X-ray laser, collect the diffraction pattern, and then you put the same sample, a copy of the same sample, and do it again. The sample will d be completely destroyed when you do this uh, type of experiment, but uh, the X-rays have gone through the sample and uh, uh, will give you uh, sufficient s information about the sample. So now what you do is, based on this kind of data, you have to reconstruct your sample, like in this case, a simulation of a protein. And so you have many noisy diffraction patterns, a random orientations, you have to find the orientation, average them, uh, refine the orientation, and then, ba and then uh, do the inverse problem, solve the phase trigger problem. So, in order to test this, we did some experiments in uh, uh, 2006, where uh, you hit a sample, the sample blows up, but you have time to collect the diffraction pattern. And then the you apply the phase retrieval methods and reconstruct. Uh, so this is the reconstruction. Uh, the sample was completely obliterated with this kind of power on the sample but the X-rays went through in 30 femtoseconds. Uh, so we managed to look at the diffraction before it was destroyed. So the, the for example, the second shot looked completely different where the sample was destroyed. But based on the original sample, we were able to reconstruct this uh, little uh, toy, toy model. So then, uh, we went on to image things that are injected in the beam uh, as the X-ray pulses come in. This, in this case, was a uh, virus, a mini virus, a very large virus. The, the image, the quality wasn't so great because of uh, well the limitation of the source at the time, and also the virus, since it, it's quite big, it a little wobbly, so that it's not exactly reproducible. But anyway, so some progress has been made in this direction. Uh, but let me just uh, recap a little what we discussed. So in, uh, for imaging, what you need is a very bright source. High resolution requires, in order to get a high resolution image, you need uh, a short wavelength and to be able to collect large scattering angles. Uh, a limitation of your resolution is radiation damage. Your sample can be destroyed by the radiation as you are looking at it. And so in order to go beyond this limitation, you need a very short pulse that will go through the sample um, in order to uh, uh, go through the sample before it has time to react. And this is of the order of uh, 10 femtoseconds. And now the new lasers start to be faster than that, but but still the the peak power is maybe not enough to do single proteins. But you can still image many other things, and uh, including nanocrystals. Uh, and in order to reconstruct this, there is a lot of effort in solving the computational problem that is called phase retrieval or generalization of it. 
And uh, so uh, the typical like uh, tutorial for phase retrieval is uh, the uh, that you start from a from a you initialize your model, your initial image. You apply your initial constraint. You know, for example, that the protein has a certain maximum size. Fully transform, uh, enforce the data, then propagate back, enforce the model again, and you go back and forth. In reality, this simple uh, algorithm doesn't work very well because you have um, this is a, a not a alt it's called alternating projection, but the two uh, constraints that are being applied, the fitting of the data, in especially is non-convex, and that means that you're trying to find the intersection between a convex uh, constraint, a, con a convex set of uh, uh, structures that are constrained by, for example, a, a support region, and the, uh, the fitting the data, however, is non-convex. That means that uh, you have, uh, if you just apply alternative projection, you can end up in a region where you have a local minima. So there are other methods that go beyond that. Uh, but also experimentally, uh, I'm gonna go quickly through a couple of more. So one, one so there are a couple of methods that allow you to solve this inverse problem. Uh, that are more experimental and more hardware based. One is holography, X-ray holography. And the, then there is Black CDI that I will skip. Uh, and then, why is it that small? Uh, and then I'll show a little bit of tomography, uh, sorry, tychography, which is another interesting technique that has been uh, uh, growing in the past 10 years or so. So uh, if, you, uh, if you remember the properties of a Fourier transform, wh when you collect the Fourier transform absolute square and then inverse Fourier transform that, you get the autocorrelation of your sample. So now, if your sample looks like this, the autocorrelation will look something like this. And the idea is you have to go from, from here to here, back. And, and that's a difficult problem. But if you put a dot, a point, next to it, then the autocorrelation of these two objects will contain the autocorrelation of the big object and the cross-correlation between the object and the point. And the cross-correlation between the object and the point will give you uh, a copy of the original sample that you wanted. And that's called the uh, Fourier holography. So basically, what you have to do is put a reference point near your sample, collect the Fourier transform magnitude square, and then select the region of your uh, sample, right? So it sounds simple, but not so simple because you have to uh, fabricate this reference point next to it, or a reference light source coherent to this. So, uh, so back in uh, maybe 2004, uh, some guys in uh, Germany, uh, Berlin, Bessie Synchrotron, uh, they made it with a focus time beam. They nanofabricated a sample, put the magnetic film here and a reference point nearby. The X-ray beam goes through, collect the diffraction pattern, and then they get a picture of the um, magnetic uh, field information. In particular, they, they use the uh, dichroism, which is a contrast mechanism that you can get from a, uh, from a magnetically oriented materials. If you go at the absorption edge of the, mat of the uh, ion in that particular material, if the ion uh, spin is oriented one way or the other, you get a different contrast. And so you could get the magnetic field information at nanoscale uh, resolution. Now the problem, one problem is that there is very little light that goes through this pinhole. And so the, con the uh, signal to noise of the photon, the short noise, it becomes quite uh, bad. So an, uh, one way around is to put a, a set of pinholes, instead of one, uh, just one, you put a set of pinholes. Uh, in particular, this is a a specifically uh, or, uh, structured set of pinholes that is called uniformly redundant array, whereby all the, all the distances are repeated the same amount of time. So that makes the inversion, the deconvolution easier. So you get the correlation, the autocorrelation of 
this, this, and the cross correlation between the two, uh, between these two, and so you you have this sample, collect the diffraction pattern, do an inverse Fourier transform, then you select this region, and you do have to, to deconvolve with this particular structure, and that particular structure is made in such a way that the dip the convolution is easy, so you get a picture of the original sample that you wanted. Uh, you can also do it on the fly, so you should, you send a pair uh, uh, multiple samples, and once in a while you are lucky enough that the two samples, uh, two the uh, reference gold nanosphere and the sample are uh, in the same region, and you hit it with the free electron laser, get a diffraction pattern, and you get a hologram of the particle um, uh, that is as on the fly. So next I will show you a little other technique that has been developed in uh, recent years uh, that has enabled the highest resolution X-ray imaging uh, to date. Uh, so in this case, you have uh, this X-ray diffraction pattern. You collect, still collect diffraction patterns uh, from a sample. Uh, so you have a focus beam hit, hitting the sample and then you collect the diffraction pattern. If you are able to solve the uh, phase retrieval problem and propagate back, you get an image of this little region of the sample. And the resolution is given by how big your detector is in the wavelength. And so uh, with this you can achieve uh, or a wavelength resolution as long as you don't destroy your sample. So if you stay within the uh, radiation damage limit, uh, in principle, you can reconstruct this little region. Now you combine this with the scanning system. Th there's another met um, imaging method that is called a scanning X-ray microscope, where you have a focus beam made by a lens, and you just scan around and collect, just collect the transmission through the sample. And uh, this kind of scan scanning microscope uh, is actually quite popular, it's really, I mean, it's kind of simple, but popular. Uh, and then you can change wavelength and do uh, different type of contrast, look at different contrasts, look at the chemical, uh, what's, what are the chemical elements inside here, uh, what is their bonding state, so whether it's uh, ox uh, uh, oxidized or not oxidized, uh, and and you get a, also you can look at a very large sample. So now, the, uh, but if you do just the scanning microscope uh, system without collecting the full diffraction pattern, but just looking at the transmitted light, uh, the resolution is limited by how well you can focus your beam. And that again is limited by how well you can make your lens. So that is roughly 20 or so nanometers. Uh, actually, 20 is uh, when you do really uh, make an a big effort. But if you collect the diffraction pattern, you can reconstruct inside and get a higher resolution. And the other advantage is that in this system, you can collect many diffraction patterns with overlapping regions. And so, um, so uh, you have a sm if you use a small step size, you have a redundant set of information uh, that enables you to solve this inverse problem much more efficiently and more reliably. So what you have is, a and that give will give you a, a high resolution information of a large uh, sample uh, down to the wavelength limit. So what you have is a set of uh, a set of uh, diffraction patterns that come from different regions of the sample. You have a l very large dimensional data, data set from the sample, and you have a lower dimensional space. So what you do is, you again, you apply these kind of alternating methods where you fit the model, fit the data, back and forth. Um, and then there are, uh, and you get a picture of the sample. There are many, uh, the alternating projection method that I just described is kind of used for tutorial, but there are more advanced methods that uh, speed up the things. And uh, you actually want little fast methods because these data sets are quite big and uh, you want to actually image your sample and go home with a picture, not wait a month 
uh, or not even go home and look at the next sample. Uh, so uh, you need to be able to solve it quickly. So this is, uh, well, mathematically you can describe this exper experiment where you have a sample, a, a long unknown vector. You have a matrix that will extract pieces of this vector and multiply them by some illumination, put a transform, uh, take the absolute value, that's your data. And what you have to do is invert this. So you have this kind of alternating projection where you have your sample, they you start from uh, empty sample, you split, multiply by illumination that you know, uh, put a transform, replace the magnitudes with the no measured ones, and keep the phase, the inverse Fourier transform, and merge the, all the frames, overlap them all, and then normalize and go back and forth. That's the alternating projection. Now, in order to do it fast, uh, we developed this uh, kind of scheme where the microscope is integrated with a computer cluster that will uh, do some rough analysis of rough, like a uh, calibration of your data, send it to the um, uh, loop that will uh, uh, polish up the uh, diffraction patterns and then send them to a iterative algorithm that will uh, start processing immediately as you start acquiring the data. I don't know if I have any ani animation. Ah, oh yeah, yeah. You can see that the microscope, like, quite soon starts giving images, and then it keeps refining for a while to get a better image. But this is all kind of using a, a kind of a big cluster uh, attached, which processes data in real time. Now, as an example uh, of application, I mean, uh, lots of, there are different, like, uh, we studied uh, cement, uh, Photovoltaics and so on. This is a, an example of a of a of a battery. What happens if you're charging and discharging? This is a lithium-ion phosphate battery, and so the 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 problem is to understand why they fail and why they decay in uh, quality. So there is a lot of work in this respect. This is one of the examples that we did, where you have a battery. Uh, you do this tachography kind of things. You do it at different wavelengths, and you can see here the different contrasts that you get. Uh, different contrasts that, that you get at different wavelengths, and this will tell you whether that's called X-ray absorption spectroscopy, and will tell you what kind of uh, state the lithium in is, whether it's charged or discharged. Uh, just very quickly, uh, this was work uh, that I did at Berkeley Lab. Now, more recently, I moved into the some kind of data analytics group where we have to handle uh, different kinds of experiments it's from uh, scattering, spectroscopy, imaging, nanocrystallography, resonance scattering. But just to give you an idea wha of the challenge with my last slide, uh, we have, uh, so we used to have a uh, detect uh, this kind of experiment where you uh, inject, uh, we started, we did the first experiment in 2009, where you inject the uh, nanocrystals, collect diffraction patterns, orient them, and get the structure of the protein. Uh, and that was working at about 10 hertz. Now we're going from 10 hertz to eight kilohertz, uh, and then more recently, 40 kilohertz. Actually, the uh, source can handle a megahertz, but the detector, uh, to 40 kilohertz. So straight out of the experiment, you get a terabyte of data. And that is, if you start even just thinking about how saving this kind of data, uh, it's a lot of money in just uh, hard drives. And then so we have to like uh, reduce it and then solve the structure. Uh, and so this is my latest challenge. Uh, if you have. So if you have uh, any question, you can come to my office and ask him. The other thing that I want to point out is that uh, here we have a lot of students that are familiar about what we can do with light with uh, telescopes. 
And then some students are familiar with about what we can do with light with the, I know, Michelson or, or different version of laser interferometers we use in LIGO. And, and sometimes these two communities, they think, they say, oh my gosh, I really have a, really have a great grasp about what we can do with the electromagnetic waves. And I think the talk of Stephen today, I know, give you an idea that there is at least another continent of a lot of interesting things that can be done. And uh, so I hope you guys keep broadening your interest uh, on, on different aspects of electromagnetics. So uh, as I said, unless someone has a burning question, try to carve a few time, a few minutes to come this afternoon and talk with Stefano if you want to. Let's clap. <laughs> Let's thank the speakers. Thanks for being here.